effectively the first time around. Excellent. Thank you. And uh, in that context, um, uh, Dean, uh, with your, your team uh, scattered all over the world from anywhere in between, from uh, uh, probably Utah to Boston and uh, uh, India, China, Mexico, what does the uh, nearshore provide? What's the value that, uh, that you get from nearshore components? Now, nearshoring uh, is a huge advantage to us because of the integrated development team that we have that we have created. Uh, light time zone, uh, cultural affinity, easy of travel uh, back and forth between uh, our site and the site in Monterey, Mexico, uh, and easy infrastructure types of requirements. We've uh, actually built an IP tunnel between our site in Provo and our site in Monterey, Mexico, in order to get uh, code images and, and daily builds um, properly to, to the team in Mexico. So nearshoring was essential component to us building an extension of our team, not just creating, um, in some cases, for example, for localization, we may have a team that we can just package up an entire project and give that to them and essentially wash our hands and they deliver it back when they're complete. With with uh, nearshoring, it was important for us to create an integrated team and an extension of our current team where engineers and testers were just other team members simply at a different location. So that, that nearshoring and that global sourcing um, it's just essential for, for that particular part, and those are the key elements. Uh, time zone, big deal um, for meetings and being able to meet and discuss things uh, face to face as well as uh, in particular work schedules that are that are complementary, as well as travel and training. Uh, Nearshoring was was cost effective for us. It's, uh, it's good to hear, and I guess uh, it's a, a um, an exact uh, model into which uh, the, the near shore component makes a lot of a lot of sense. So um, let's move on to the next uh, uh, topic, uh, the next uh, key issue, which is our governance uh, metrics and productivity. Um, and uh, probably you can address this first, uh, Dean. How do you define a governance uh, model? including people, processes, and tools to manage a geographically dispersed team, and in particular for the, the QA uh, activities. And here we can address one of the questions that we got uh, from, from the audience. Uh, if you can please uh, mention some of the tools, uh, methods that you use in particular. All right. Um, the governance model, you know, a management model for, for these people with processes, first of all, I think you have to, you have to begin using common tool sets, common vocabulary, uh, common uh, experience with with everything that you're doing. With our integrated team, those processes and things that we're doing here in our site in Provo are the exact same processes and tools that our team at SoftTech is using. So our bug tracking database, our test case database, um, our email system, uh, our collaboration tools, instant messenger and email and teaming, all those types of tools, not only do, do we develop them, but we also use those as uh, things that we are have in common so that we can build like vocabulary, we can uh, help facilitate that communication by using those types of things. Uh, and so, you know, we use a lot of open source tools like Bugzilla and Testopia. Uh, we also use um, engineering excellence types of metrics and things that are required for not only our team here in Provo, but also our team in, in uh, at SoftTech, where they have to not only log time the way we do, but we also have to account for uh, their, their activities that they do. They attend our team meetings. Um, we celebrate successes together. Uh, all of those things seem to build not only the team, but provide that governance model where not only knowledge transfer is more successful, but also team unity, passion, commitment for the delivery of the product, and everybody has skin in the game. 
and it's not just a job, uh, which I think is an important part of, of any software product, but as you move from all in-house type of development to nearshoring or, or offshoring types of resources, you need to create that same type of governance model with your people and your process and tools. Uh, otherwise, those geographic, cultural, and other differences will become uh, inhibitors that, that impede the progress and success of your software product. Excellent, uh, Dean. And um, unfortunately, we're running a little bit short on time, so if you can uh, please quickly address, and uh, probably we, we can start with you, uh, Carla, and uh, then you, we can hand it over to Dean. If you can please address the, the, the last uh, question on, on metrics. Uh, which type of metrics uh, do you use to measure productivity? Carla? Yes, sorry, I was fighting with the event to the server, my mute button. <laughs> um, I guess um, in terms of, of, of specific to dealing with productivity, um, uh, you want to have uh, at least two perspectives. Um, you want to make sure that they're being as effective as they can be from a defect detection, defect retention perspective. So. Um, uh, that rate has to be measured and controlled uh, within the scope of each of the functions that you have in your application. Um, from a testing perspective, in terms of execution and diagnosis, how, how well acquainted a tester is with its function as well as the test cases that they have to execute, um, there could be a combination of execution of the number of test cases executed um, based on a specific percentage distribution of complexity. So it won't take them the same to do a complex test case versus a simple test case. So uh, having those considerations, I think that you'll be able to oversee, um, you know, from a, from, a, from a very simplistic manner. You know, you, there's many other possible combinations that, that that you can use, but as a first approach, you definitely want that uh, initial um, those those two metrics at the beginning to, to to make sure at least that you're being as effective as you can be, and that you are leveraging the utilization of the team as much as possible. Now, let's just to jump in here on that question, um, Novell measures the success of the quality of a product by doing surveys. The ultimate test is customer satisfaction. So that's one way that we uh, determine whether our testing is effective. Now during the testing process, there's several metrics that we measure. The number of test cases written, the number of test cases run, the pass rates, um, and we track defect trends, which includes uh, the number of defects found, number fixed, and those moving averages, and then quality metrics around the severity of defects. Over the life of a product, you expect the severity of critical and major defects to, de to decrease as probably minor and uh, normal defects increase as the testing gets deeper. So those are some of the ways that we have measure effectiveness of a product um, before it actually shoots. Yeah, certainly um, the, the voice of the customer is the ultimate test, right? Absolutely. Okay. Well, unfortunately, uh, uh, we have uh, run out of time. Uh, thank you uh, both for a very, very engaging uh, conversation. Thank you very much, Dean, and thank you very much, Carla. Uh, this um, conversation is going to be available for on-demand reproduction starting uh, this uh, Friday. Uh, you can find it at softtech.com slash perspectives. So you can go to our website, uh, click on perspectives, and uh, you can download it for on-demand reproduction. Uh, where, uh, you can also find some other uh, interesting resources about uh, uh, testing as well as application security and uh, uh, outsourcing in general. So with that, uh, I would like to thank you all for attending this uh, session today. Thank you very much again, uh, Dean, and thank you very much, uh, Carla. Thank you. Thank you.